great pleasure to introduce Beverly West, who was my very first EE teacher in the fall of some year in the past. And uh, she'll be talking about the Cody special issue in gaming the world, differential equations, and influence public policy. Hello. I'm substituting for Samer Haber, who is the editor of the special issue, but he lives in Beirut, Lebanon, and it's just too dangerous, especially in the South, for him to do any traveling right now. We've had a complicated time all year because of difficulties with his internet and electricity. They don't only get those for portions of each day. But we've been working together for a long time, and I'd like to start by telling you that story. 32 years ago, I got a letter from a young man asking if there were any way he could attend some of our first Cody workshops in, for colleagues, faculty colleagues in differential equations. Because he was not a US citizen, he could not apply for the MSF. Um, yeah. conference. And my husband Jim and I just looked at each other and he said, well, let him stay with us and then there won't be any expense for a hotel and so forth. And that just began a long, long term of collaboration. So for 32 years, and I think we're the only two people that were with Cody from the very beginning, uh, it's been a real pleasure to work together. So what I'm going to read is um, mostly Summer's words, which he wrote for the preface, and I'm doing the best I can to do what he would have done. Public policy is an important issue because it provides structures and strategies by which our society can work to address and resolve some of the current social, economic, environmental, public health, educational, behavioral, and other issues. Mathematical modeling of real life problems through differential equations can help in understanding how systems in our society operate and can provide guidance in problem solving and analyzing the effectiveness of public policies that govern society's response to issues. While one semester class can be too short to have actual influence on public policy, there is much opportunity to widen students' perspective and prepare them to do the necessary research and guide them in how to write and present their results effectively. Following two Cody E earlier special issues, the first was linking differential equations to social justice and environmental concerns. That was 2018. The second was Differential equations in today's world, I guess it was engaging students, differential equations in today's world. We have sought in this current issue, engaging the world, differential equations can influence public policies. Contributions that highlight how differential equations may be used to reflect on questions such as, how to describe public policies quantitatively and embed these descriptions into differential equations. How to measure the effectiveness or adjust public policies to fit a desired purpose. And how we can develop a mathematical fluency among students when discussing mathematics and public policy. The collection of papers received and published speak to the discovery of where and how differential equations can influence public policies in government and non-governmental agencies. Due to the variety of topics covered, we have grouped these papers into four categories. So there are 13 papers all together, and I'll be going through them one and one after I describe the categories. The first category are epidemic-related papers, and there are three of them. The first of these by five women at the um, seven women at the Claremont Colleges 
is on how to open or not to open, developing a COVID-19 model specific to small relational residential campuses. And Christina Edholm will be speaking on that um, a little later in this session. They discuss a real-time project to help the administrators at their colleges decide whether to reopen their campuses in the fall of 2021, where a key element was the introduction of vaccines. To help guide this decision, authors formulated an ODE model capturing the dynamics of the spread of COVID-19 on a residential campus. Then, this is the unique thing, they created an app which could be operated by the policymakers themselves to explore other parameter settings. That's what the right-hand side of this slide shows is that a screenshot from that app. That contribution allowed the administrators to have a deeper understanding of the models and the opportunity to try their own input. The findings were extrapolated to a general audience thus democratizing the policy-making process. Now, the little network graph on the left was uh, the various uh, populations they divided Los Angeles County into. Okay, the next question, applying the SIR model, can students advise the mayor of a small community this came to us from Australia, where Mark Nelson and his two students, Karen Goosen and Mahini Watanabe, described a classroom project for a modeling scenario using the SIR epidemic model in a simulated community of 3,000 people. The theoretical mayor had asked the students of a third year mathematics course to determine what would happen before vaccines were introduced to the population if no action was taken. And they had to evaluate the options of lockdowns, social distancing, hand hygiene, masks, and various combinations, and to recommend the best course of action. Then the students made oral presentations to their classmates who played the roles of mayor and community members. So that graph is showing the level of effect infectives for the various options, plotted versus time. Then we have a paper of fitting a COVID-19 model incorporated senses of safety and caution to local data from Spartanburg County, South Carolina. Chloe Griffin and Amanda Mangum discuss how SIR models have generally failed to capture the nature of the COVID-19 pandemic's multiple waves, primarily because they do not take into account public policies such as social distancing, mask mandates, and stay-at-home orders. This paper examines experimental data from Spartanburg County, South Carolina, giving insight into the changing social response toward the pandemic within the county. And the graph shows a comparison between USA data in blue and South Carolina data in red. Our second category is engaging students in the classroom. And we have two papers from that. First is something you're going to hear about very soon this afternoon. Differential equations for a changing world how to engage students in learning and applying differential equations. Beyond Luo presents a detailed approach to planning and teaching an intensive five-week summer differential equations course. The paper suggests tips for creating an interactive and supportive learning environment to optimize student engagement with a focus on real-world situations and a special attention to ways differential equations can be relevant to creating public policies. Beyond has done this for several years with amazing results. His students are very fortunate for his devoted attention. The graphs shown on the slide are from an exercise on 
differing behaviors near equilibrium depending on what the parameters are. The other engagement paper is by Michelle Greif Grist at um, Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington, raising student awareness of environmental issues via writing assignments with differential equations. She's done this in two different classes, an integral calculus class and a differential equations course. Two assignments, one on carbon storage and the other on pollution in the Spokane River focus student attention on sustainability concerns while also developing other essential skills such as technical writing and environmental awareness. The graph shows the seasonal difference in flow rates per day in the section of river under study. Note that the outflow in red and the inflow in blue are slightly offset. Okay, our third collection are three papers in population dynamics. The first is by Jim Sandifer at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. He examines differential equations that model the sustainable, sustainable being a key word, harvesting of species having different characteristics. The focus is on how maximizing profit can affect the harvesting strategy. When this leads to collapse of a particular species population, regulation becomes necessary to restore the stock. While studying the economics, Jim Sandifer also concentrates on fruitful techniques for analysis, such as shown on the slide, there is the phase line on the left and a bifurcation diagram on the right. Li Zhang wrote on blue whale and krill populations modeling. It's about an undergraduate mathematical modeling course where predator prey models are taught to students who are expected to use the numerical and graphical methods to observe the qualitative long term behavior of whale and krill populations. The author emphasizes the importance of strengthening student awareness of protecting endangered species and its impact on climate change and global habitability. Lee uses several graphics to demonstrate. The line across the top shows that whales eat krill, eat phytoplankton, and then the arrows show which way is the these three populations are moving as caused by global warming, the arrow going up on the right. The phase plane trajectory on the left is one way to show the individual population trajectories on the right over time. And our third population paper is nonlinear dynamics of mountain pine beetle populations, discussion of forestry policy, a survey of existing mathematical models, and code-based demonstration. This is done by Scott Strong and Maya Mays Johnson at the Colorado School of Mines. Mountain pine beetles cause a significant destruction of Colorado lodgepole pine forests. The projected warmer environment increases the problem emphasizing the need for effective land management policies. In this paper, Strong and Mays Johnson use partial differential equations to model the insect-plant interaction and offer insights into possible mitigation strategies. And once again, we have a series of three graphs. They're phase portraits for trees versus beetles and show very different results for different parameters. You have to see that up close to be able to really get it. Our last category is longest. It's an assortment of unique modeling projects using differential equations. So the first is modeling aircraft takeoffs by Catherine Cavagnaro at Suwanee University of the South. 
Catherine is an airline pilot and instructor, and she showcases in her paper an application modeling aircraft motion for takeoff to ensure safety during takeoff. Aircraft safety is definitely a matter of public concern, although it's the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, that actually makes the regulation, so we don't have such direct possibilities of affecting it. In trying to understand the takeoff rules, Catherine raises some circumstances for which the current rules for takeoff fall short of their goal, and she uses basic physics to explain the problems that pilots can occur and suggest a better rule for takeoff. Next, we have two papers from Tufts University, and we are really thrilled with the creative thoughts that come out of um, our colleagues there. The first, by Bruce Bogosian and Christoph Burgers, models wealth concentration and taxation. They explain how modeling can be used to explore the effects of taxation on the emergence of oligarchs. Now, what is an oligarch? Um, one definition is a person wealthy enough to control enough resources to influence politics or government in a meaningful way. Their model suggests that oligarchs will emerge when wealth taxation is below a certain threshold, and that taxation of income and capital gains alone cannot prevent the emergence of oligarchs. The second paper from Tufts, ODEs and Mandatory Voting, is by Christoph with several co-authors. Are these students? Uh, no, the no, colleagues. Okay. Uh, we'll give them uh, their names. Natasha Dragovic, Anna Hench, Arkads Kirstein and Lilla Orr. Okay. They prevent the mathematics relevant to the question whether voting should be mandatory. And if you heard Christoph speak this morning, you heard a little more about it. It models how politicians might adjust their positions to raise their share of the vote. Various scenarios are explored using an app that the authors have developed, engaging students in a rather unusual context. And this particular graph shows the proportion of the population voting for each candidate as a function of voter loyalty. This graph did not go up. Pardon? This graph did not go up here. That is a graph. Well, no, no you're right. You okay, know. one more slide. Whoops, no. the back one. There it is. Thank you. Okay, two to go. Victor Donay at Bryn Mawr College has had an amazing track record of modeling courses with community-based projects, and he's got a page and a half listing of places where they have succeeded over several years in actually making outcomes from cafeteria trays and waste disposal um, to solar panels outside um, the college campus on the community building. So this paper was about introducing the topic of solar power, how to apply Euler's method for differential equations to determine the energy generated, and how to provide a variety of lesson extensions that engage students in an exploration of policy issues related to climate change. These examples are used to empower learners to use their mathema mathematical skills to help create solutions. The unique outcome of Donay's classes is that he develops community partners who work with the students, so these projects actually do bring about visible public policy results. Victor has been doing this for many years with an impressively long list of positive results. And I should say that each semester he brings in two or three, maybe three or four, 
community partners to speak at the beginning of the semester on a problem they'd like to solve, and then the students can turn in a list of their preferences or which project they would like to work with. Um, Victor says almost always they all get their first choice, and then they go off and they work the semester with these partners and come up with solutions. So the photographs on the left, it's the um, solar panels on campus, but I've already told you there's some in the community. And on the right is a panel of Bryn Mawr students presenting their results to the commissioners of whatever local entity it is. Lastly, Christopher Evard, Kelly Johnson, Michael Carls, and Nicole Rainier used a sand tank groundwater model to investigate groundwater flow. They describe a tabletop physical model that illustrates how groundwater flows through an aquifer, how water wells work, and the effects of contaminants introduced into an aquifer. The authors explain how the model can be used to simulate groundwater flow through an aquifer with a no flow, flow boundary condition. This has obvious implications for influencing public policy on water quality. Now, it's, yes, it involves um, PDEs, but the paper begins with an introduction to the heat equation, which usually is the first model studied in per partial differential equations, and their groundwater flow equation follows from this, so it's not a difficult um, step to get up to the PDE. So their apparatus is shown on the right, and on the left is part of the introduction to the heat equation. Okay, now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for listening. Download, read, and enjoy. Our editor-in-chief, Myla Harari, cannot be here today, but she has done a monumental job of getting all these papers up on the web yesterday. So they are all accessible right away. In previous years, we had to um, wait until March for them to get up. So many, many kudos to Myla for doing this. And we have three copies of binders, which is a habit I've gotten into since we usually made this presentation with three months to go before they got up on the web. So this is to prove that they really exist. Feel free to come up and peruse them. And they will be here the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Questions? We have time for maybe a question or two. Ah, oh, everything was perfect, huh? <laughs> I guess so. Okay, well, I think we should stop and let them come and grab the real thing. Yeah, I would probably make a comment if I can. Yes. So, I uh, just wanted for people who may not know, we have a discussion session today at 4, and the discussion session will be related to these uh, all topics we have attended today, and uh, for a special issue for this all party community, so who this should be given to Beverly for running this session for so many years and allowing us kind of join her in this effort. So I still remember the first time I was attended this session, it was for me, it is probably even earlier. So for me, it was 2000, I believe 18 or 19. I was a speaker and I got so attached to them since then, I am trying to be here and close to this community every year. So actually this is a very nice community not just a journal or a section organizer. This is a community of the people, and this community will have a discussion session, of course, so you are very welcome to join. 
So I want to thank Victoria and Mika for taking over arranging these sessions because it's more than I can do now. And I really am grateful. Thank you very much. All right, well, let's thank several ladies.